Almost 90 years ago, in 1933, King Kong was released. The film made a massive impact in popular culture, influencing a whole new generation. And with the recent films, it's clear that the popularity of King Kong will never die. King Kong was the brainchild of Marion Cooper, a filmmaker who before arriving in Hollywood led an extraordinary life of adventure and exploration, which he documented. He was unique. Um, he had a background of journalism, for one thing, and uh, uh, he had gone out to remote places to make fascinating documentary films. He was not a Hollywood person, per se. I don't want to put Hollywood people down, but he was different. While finding new film ideas for King Kong, he remembered a book that his uncle gave him when he was six years of age, titled Adventures in Equatorial Africa. Published in 1861, the book depicted many fascinating stories, including villagers being pulled out of their camps while fending off vicious animals. But it was the stories of gorillas of awesome sizes which fascinated Cooper the most. The idea for King Kong would come to him in a dream about a giant gorilla terrorizing New York City. When he woke up, he recorded the idea. He imagined a giant gorilla on top of the Empire State Building. When arriving in Hollywood, Cooper worked his way up the ranks as a screenwriter, producer and director at RKO and MGM. He would draw the attention of writer, producer Ernest Schoderstack, who worked for film pioneer and producer Jesse Lasky who in 1927 would hire Cooper and Schoderstack to produce a number of films together. Cooper was contracted by RKO Pictures. He worked as producer and director on a number of productions. His most well-known pictures included The Four Feathers and the adventure film She, a film which Cooper would later refer to as his worst picture. Cooper came up with many scenarios and wanted to capture on film a real gorilla from the Congo and have it fight a real Komodo dragon. This was inspired from his friend, adventurer Douglas Burden, who was the first human to encounter a real Komodo dragon on Komodo Island. The scenario of a fight between Kong and a Komodo dragon was later changed into the battle between Kong and a T-Rex. Originally, King Kong was referred to by Cooper as the giant terror gorilla picture and described his film idea as a gigantic semi-humanoid gorilla pitted against modern civilization. He named the character of the oversized gorilla Kong, stating that he liked the mystery word aspect of Kong's name. Finding a title for Cooper's project was an arduous task, with the film originally titled The Beast. This title unimpressed the executives at RKO. Producer David O. Selznick, who was starting out as a producer at RKO, suggested a number of titles, like Kong, King of Beasts, Kong, the Jungle King, and Kong, the Jungle Beast. But Cooper wanted to name the film after the main character, Kong. Selznick thought audiences would think that the film was a documentary, mainly because of the one-word title of Kong. So Cooper added the word King to Kong's name, changing the title to King Kong. Cooper contracted mystery writer Edgar Wallace to write the first draft of the screenplay. Sadly, Wallace passed away in 1932 while writing the screenplay. Ruth Rose would be hired to write the final draft of the screenplay. The main story revolves around director Carl Denham, along with his leading actress Anne Darrow and leading man Jack Driscoll, travel by ship with a large crew to his new jungle location for his next picture, the island known as Skull Island. On this island, the local natives worship a huge gorilla called Kong. After abducting Anne, the villagers offer her as a sacrifice to Kong. After grabbing Anne, and taking her into the deep jungle, Kong falls in love with Anne and becomes infatuated with her. The director and the crew go on a rescue mission into the jungle to be faced with perils beyond their wildest imagination, facing giant animals and dinosaurs. The director and the crew, after rescuing Anne, capture Kong and bring him to New York City as part of an exhibition 
exhibiting Kong as the eighth wonder of the world. In the middle of the show, Kong escapes, causing mayhem and destruction throughout New York City in order to find his mate, Anne Darrow. The film was given the green light by RKO. King Kong would become one of the most expensive films ever made at that time. Marion Cooper hired special effects pioneer Willis O'Brien. In the designing of the character of Kong, Cooper wanted him to be a nightmarish gorilla monster. O'Brien and effects artist Marcel Delgado sculpted the first animation model. He told Delgado to make the ape almost human. Cooper found O'Brien's sketches of a half ape half-human, with long hair, laughable. O'Brien was asked to change the design and add human features. Cooper wanted to change the half-human look of Kong and make him a full, oversized gorilla. Cooper wanted Kong to walk more upright, to appear more intimidating. Cooper went to the American Museum of Natural History and he found the dimensions for a bull gorilla more appropriate for the design and told O'Brien, now that's what I want. The final model would have the basic look of a gorilla, but managed in some way to maintain human-like characteristics. Cooper stated, I want Kong to be the fiercest, most brutal, monstrous damn thing that has ever been seen. Cinematographer, producer and director Ernest Chodostak was hired as a co-director. Cooper would shoot the action sequences while Shodostak would shoot the scenes between the actors. In casting the main hero of the film, Jack Driscoll, they originally intended for Joel McRae, but it was rumoured that McRae's agents demanded more money. They even asked for Clark Gable, but he was busy with other projects, so the role was given to actor Bruce Cabot. Cabot was quite a ladies' man in real life and had great difficulty playing an awkward character in his scenes with Fay Ray. For the lead actress in the film, Cooper saw a blonde in the role of Anne Darrow. RKO considered Ginger Rogers and Jean Harlow, but Cooper decided to cast Fay Ray, who was in fact a brunette. Ray would personally choose her wig at the Max Factor shop in Los Angeles. Now, the, the man who, who made that film really said that to me uh, first off when I went to talk to him about the, the playing this part and he said, Fay, you're going to have the tallest, darkest leading man in Hollywood. Uh, you thought, who did you think it was going to be? I was hoping it was going to be Cary Grant. Fay Ray would make four other films during the production of King Kong, which was shot over a period of eight months. She was able to shoot the films Dr. X, The Most Dangerous Game, and Mystery of the Wax Museum. Cooper would constantly change some of the shooting schedules so Fay Ray could be available. Even before the script was completed, Cooper would start filming the action sequences with Fay Ray and Robert Armstrong, who was cast as filmmaker Carl Denham. It actually took a year after the actors were finished filming and for O'Brien to finish the effects. The film took a while to complete. The film The Most Dangerous Game was actually an overlapping film production during the making of King Kong, which began shooting in May of 1932 and was actually produced by Cooper alongside his co-director, Shodostak. In fact, the jungle scenes were actually filmed on the same set as the jungle scenes in The Most Dangerous Game, which incidentally also happened to star King Kong actors Fay Ray and Robert Armstrong. Animator Willis O'Brien and his effects crew built the models and sets, making a number of Kong models of different sizes. The bust of Kong was built to scale at 40 feet high. The 40 foot large size scale model of Kong needed three men to sit inside, operating the various levers to change the facial expressions one model was 18 feet, but would be rescaled to 24 feet for the New York sequences and a giant hand for the close-ups of Fay Ray in Kong's grasp. For the scenes with Fay Ray in Kong's hand, the hand was attached to a crane and raised 10 feet. She would later say her terror in those scenes was in fact real. The more she struggled, the looser the hand's grip. When she thought she was about to fall, she had to signal Cooper to stop filming. 
a huge arm that was large enough to have fingers that went around my waist and lifted me up. That must have been terrifying. It was a, me a mechanical hand. Yes, big mechanical that's right. Hand. Yes. The 18-inch model was made from a metal mesh skeleton, a mixture of rubber and foam for the muscle structure and rabbit fur for his hair. The smaller miniature model of Kong at 22 inches was made out of rubber but would rapidly dry out so the model would have to continually be rebuilt. Interesting to note that the 22 inch high model in 2009 was actually sold at an auction for over $203,000. Cooper stated he's different in almost every shot. Sometimes he's only 18 feet tall and sometimes 60 feet or larger. This broke every rule that O'Brien and his animators had ever worked with, but all felt confident that if the scenes moved with excitement and beauty, the audience would accept any height that fitted into the scene. Kong's roar was in fact a lion's roar and a tiger's roar combined, slow down and run backward. For Kong and the dinosaur models, O'Brien used the method of stop motion animation, a method he would use earlier for dinosaur models in The Lost World in 1925. He created several dinosaur models for his unfinished production of Creation in 1931, which he would reuse for King Kong. The most epic use of stop motion was in the scene with Kong fighting a vicious T-Rex. In designing this scene, Cooper and Shodostak, who used to be wrestlers, would act out the battle between the T-Rex and Kong in the effects studio before the animators shot the scene. Close-ups of the pilots and gunners of the planes that attacked Kong were shot in the studio with mock-up planes. The flight commander is in fact Cooper, and his observer is Shodostak. They decided to play the parts. The giant gates on Skull Island and the wall of the native village was originally used as part of the set of the Temple of Jerusalem for Cecil B. DeMille's biblical epic, The King of Kings, in 1927. The wall was also later reused in David O. Selznick's The Garden of Allah in 1936 and again in Gone with the Wind for the sequence where Scarlet and Rhett leave Atlanta as it burns. The theatre sequence was filmed in one day at Los Angeles Shrine Auditorium. Not counting pre-production work, the production lasted for 55 weeks. Composer Max Steiner composes an exciting score. Originally, RKO wanted to trim costs by not using an original score, so they ordered Max Steiner to reuse some of his old tracks. This did not go down well with Cooper, who paid Steiner 50000 of his own money for a brand new score. Steiner drafted a 46-piece orchestra and completed the score in six weeks. The studio later reimbursed Cooper. It has been said that this was the first Hollywood film to use a fully symphonic musical score at the preview screening in San Bernardino, California. In January of 1933, the audience was greatly affected by the gory and grisly scenes in the film and screamed or left the theatre. Cooper cut the grisly scenes out. King Kong made its debut at the two largest theatres in New York City, the Roxy and Radio City Music Hall. The total seating capacity was about 10,000 and it sold out every performance at both theatres. The success of this film is often credited for saving RKO pictures from being bankrupt. Apparently, as legend has it, King Kong was among Adolf Hitler's favourite films, alongside Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Actors Robert Armstrong, Victor Wong, Noble Johnson and Steve Clement would return and reprise their roles for the sequel, Son of Kong, in 1933. King Kong was iconic memorable and one of the most groundbreaking films of its time, mainly for its amazing stop-motion effects, inspiring generations of filmmakers and special effects experts to follow. Kong is a character used in countless films, TV shows, cartoons and theme parks. King Kong is a true classic and a film to be celebrated. My name's Jonathan. Thanks so much for watching.
If you enjoy this video, please remember to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like what you see on my channel and would like to support me on Patreon, click on the link below.